It's 4 o'clock on a Monday. You know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woohoo! <laughs> this week, starring special guest stars Mr. Bobby Borg <laughs> and Mr. Rick. Hastily. Hasty. 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 I give him the L whenever I feel like it. <laughs> Hello, everybody in the chat room. Let me double check to make sure we are, in fact, broadcasting. Uh, I don't know where the heck that went. Anyway, okay. Uh, I always like to check that because sometimes I've actually done a show where moments later I found out I wasn't. <laughs> it's happened. Anyway, these gentlemen have written a book, there we go, uh, called Personal Finance for Musicians. And, uh, you know, it's not a topic that I ever thought I would be doing on the show. But then I did, I looked at the book this weekend, didn't read it cover to cover as I've been known to do, but I did skim it. And I love talking about finance. And uh, so I want to let you know that Britt on the end down there is an MBA, uh, is the department chair of the business admin department at Los Angeles City College. He's also an adjunct professor at UCLA, University of Massachusetts and Chapman University, where he was awarded faculty of the year in 2004 and serves an advise, as an advisory board member for the UCLA Financial Programs Council. He holds an MBA from Chapman, which I've actually been on the campus, yes, campus, campus of Chapman. Uh, and then Bobby Borg, who you guys well know, he's been here many times, but nonetheless, he's got an MCM, uh, what the heck, it's a Master's, master's in Communication, communication and Mark. Uh, oh, Management, yeah, uh -huh. okay. MCM, uh, Management, Masters of Communication Management, there you go. <laughs> is a former recording and touring artist, the founder of Bobby Borg Consulting, and the author of The Musician's Handbook. You guys have seen these books many, many times. Musician's Handbook, Music Marketing for the DIY Musician, Business Basics for Musicians, and Introduction to Music Publishing for Musicians. He's an adjunct professor at music of music industry studies at University of Southern California's Thornton School of Music. He holds an MCM, the aforementioned MCM, from the University of Southern California, Mr. Bobby Borg. <laughs> so, I've got to ask, and by the way, if I get out of frame today, it's, it, yep. it was hard setting up for three people. You should see the rig here. So if I'm like, hello, you'll know why. Anyway, um, why? Why this book? I would have never thought in a million years <laughs> that you would write a book about musician finance. But then again, I know you. you're a very serious guy, a very thoughtful guy, and a very responsible guy. And I bet that during your rock and roll years, you were probably the guy upstairs on tour balancing your checkbook, rather than a party. <laughs> yeah, that's correct, yeah, actually, yeah. So, well, a little bit of, a little having fun as well. But, for, uh, you know, first, before I wanna, before we get started, definitely I'm gonna answer this question, but before we get started, I just Thanks, want Bobby. to. <laughs> I just want to, um, I just want to point out, uh, generally speaking, we, we're uh, having a conversation today about personal finance, but we don't want you to take this as actual advice because that would not be professional for us to say that. Um, it is always wise to get a certified financial planner that will sit down with you and look at your particular situation to make sure that you're handled right. And that's the responsible thing to say simply because when we're dealing with money, right, that's a very, very important issue. Yeah, but the lawyers answer, on the show always make me say <laughs> stuff like that too. And, and I get it, you know, yeah. none of us are legally expert, let's say, mm -hmm. but you obviously have of an course. opinion having you know, been And, and listen, and the truth is, is a lot of times when you do meet with a financial planner, you actually know just as much, if not more than them. But of course, I just, you know. something I want to get yeah, to later too, because yeah. I've, I've had meetings with several over the years and walked out of there shaking my head. Yeah, going, I mean, really, you guys. Cookie cutter crap. Yeah, it's not rocket science. And, um, and, and basically, you can learn this stuff. But again, I just to be professional, I thought I would give that little disclaimer. So now to answer your question. Yes, why? So, you know, <laughs> the interesting 
interesting thing is, is that, you know, when looking at musicians or even looking at people in the sports industry, you know, what you have is you have people that make major, major sacrifices for many, many years and mm -hmm. sometimes without making a whole lot of money. And then all of a sudden, you know, the money starts coming in and you have absolutely no idea what to do with it. So you start to new car, you know, new house. Exactly. And you do that <laughs> a lot of taxes, times. Right? Yeah. To, <laughs> you know, you do that a lot of times to justify or to make yourself feel better for all those years that right. you were struggling. I've you know, this. And, 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 you know, and then finally you go out and you're like, okay, now I have to show people that I'm doing well. So you want to roll up to the party in the big car and all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, unfortunately, people don't understand that, you know, success sometimes could be short-lived i mean a lot of people Most don't of have yeah, yeah. you don't have that 50-year madonna type career you know and you maybe have a hit or two and then after 10 years you, living you know above your means you now realize you all of a sudden don't have any yeah. and i just thought you know this is ridiculous you know that this continually keeps on happening and, and then even looking at like you know smaller scales just like you know your your typical musician that's just getting by and you know it's it's a middle class type musician, as as we talk about that, yeah. right? You and I you both know, love that term, yeah, the middle absolutely. class musician. You know, just people that are making a living, you know, licensing things out, you know, doing okay, doing well, supporting themselves. Even I've seen people not do things properly, properly with their money then either. You know, they they are not making certain their savings habits are bad, their investing habits are bad. So it's like there needs to be something. This yeah. is this is ridiculous. Someone needs to address this. So. And you know, you were concerned when you first asked me about if we could think about doing a show on this topic, and you said. But I've noticed at the road rally that a lot of your audience members at the rally are, you know, over 40 years old. Maybe they know all this stuff already or maybe they're doing it already. And maybe some are. But I know a lot of our members. I, I know them well. And, and sadly, I just think that creative people don't really hone in on a business frame of mind. And I would venture to say, sadly, that there are a lot of adult and <laughs> grown up yeah. taxi members that haven't thought about this stuff. And then all of a sudden you turn 50 or 60 and you go, holy crap, how am I gonna retire someday? So I think it's important for all ages, Absolutely. not just the 22 year old who's starting out that boy, if they could de develop these habits in their 20s. Yeah, oh, oh they, man, wow. Would, yeah. Wouldn't you give anything to turn back the hands of time? Uh, well, <laughs> you know, most people typically start thinking about retirement right before retirement. Right. <laughs> However, if you start thinking about this stuff as 20, it's, I mean, really, and we're, and I know what you guys are thinking. Like, I'm just starting, right? What am I thinking about retirement? You know, retirement is an old man like playing golf in Florida, age 64. You know, it, it, it can be you doing whatever you want. It gives you, it buys you freedom, essentially. That's how you have to look at retirement. It's security, freedom. safety, security, mm -hmm. and freedom. Yeah, and that could happen at any time. Some people retire at 35, you and know. And they're bored to death, but yeah. That, yeah, I wouldn't suggest that. I, I, I look forward someday to fishing every day. Um, I love saltwater fishing, but I guarantee you within 90 days, I'll be like, <laughs> what do I do with myself? So, so yeah. Britt, what got you on this topic and made you want to write this book? Well, <clears throat> most of my career I've been teaching finance, yeah. um, personal finance as well, as well as other business courses. But Bobby reached out to me and asked me if I would help out with the financial part. Of yeah, the how book. do you guys know and, each other? Uh, we go way back, actually. You were a student. Yeah, of mine actually, back I in... took one of his business oh, classes. Oh, okay. Back yeah. in 2000. And yeah. Three, four. Yeah. Okay. And he went on and graduated and went and got his master's, and he's teaching now. And he always kept in touch. And it would pick my brain here and there about some of the books that he, he wrote and marketing and branding. And when it came time for a personal finance book for musicians, he reached out to me and asked me if I'd be interested in contributing some. So um, we've pretty much stayed in touch for the last 20 some odd years. Mm -hmm. And jumping back on your point about the importance of personal finance, starting at a young age, I've actually really tried to start um, requesting that high schools teach personal finance yeah. in a junior or senior years mm -hmm. because it's so important for these 17 and 18 year olds, especially if they're artists to come out knowing what they're getting into and how to start saving their money. I don't think we've ever had this discussion. Certainly you and I, Britt, have not had this discussion, but we had 10 years ago a taxi member, uh, and I can't think of his name. I could see his face. We've had lunch together. Uh, Gooding, he goes by the name Gooding, which I'm pretty sure is his last name, but that's his artist name. And do you know he has a touring band that plays hundreds of shows per year and all they do is play junior highs and high school auditoriums, and it's a rock and roll act that teaches 
finance. Oh, wonderful. wonderful. How cool. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They teach kids how to balance a checkbook, uh, all that stuff mm-hmm. combined with rock and roll. Oh, how cool. That yeah, so cool. I should Love introduce it. you guys. Well, yeah, that sounds great. very, very cool. That's yeah, something good. That's definitely is needed. You yeah. know, they do have personal, I mean, I did some research about this a couple of years ago, and right, personal finance in high schools is something that a lot of schools neglect, and for a number of reasons, typically because it's not something covered on the you know standard tests and right. SATs, and you need specialized people to teach uh, this type of topic. So sometimes they just leave it out. Um, but unfortunately, you know, um, to the detriment of so many kids that later on in their lives, they get their credit card and they start getting into debt and they don't know how to manage their expenses. So it, this is really important stuff. Yeah, and I know. think one of the biggest problems is that when people hear the word finance, they, they run. It's, it's scary. It's a scary right, term. Right, exactly, yeah. And even when it's a personal finance, now it's about you, so it's even worse. <laughs> so I, I think there's a lot of hesitation that... Um, uh, maybe high schools and younger people don't want to learn it because they're really confused about the topic because it is, it can get confusing. But or really, because it's just a lot more fun to buy that sixty right, exactly. nine Camaro and, I think about and it later. It out. Yeah. But I mean, yeah. all personal finance is is just taking account for your your spending and your saving and what you make. That's really all there is to it. It's just budgeting those three things. Yeah. So it's, it's not hard at all. In fact, it can be fun. It can be like a puzzle. And you can set goals while you're trying to save more, or spend less, and so it can be actually be a fun little little project. But people run for the hills when they hear the word finance. I've got to say, uh, not bragging, but I do have a daughter in her twenties who's saved several tens of thousands of dollars already in her life. Good. And I figured out the way she does that is she has me get her the expensive stuff for birthdays and, yeah. and, ah, right, and there you go. that's <laughs> smart. That's, yeah. that's personal. But that yeah. kid, seriously, I've never seen her pull out her personal credit card. She's so thrifty. Mm-hmm. But yet she doesn't. She's not one of those people that's obsessed with being thrifty to the point of living a life of deprivation. There's a balance, you know. It's a balance, yeah. yeah. We'll talk about that, you know, um, on one of the questions that, that I know you're going to ask us. But one thing I do want to say is that there's a lot of people that get very um, angry about what we're just what we're talking yeah. about here. Like in other words, there's a general like. Don't try and help where, me. <laughs> for example, when I post something on TikTok, you'll have these like these kids like we'll, we'll say like you know i'm tired of you your generation telling me that i shouldn't drink seven dollar coffees and stuff like oh my that God. you should and i'm like you know and i'm like well when you when you're in debt and uh when you've got you know uh you know a lot of loans and student loans you have to pay back you know maybe you have to make some sacrifices but again i don't mean to you know pee anyone off here but you know it doesn't really matter what you actually necessarily are careful about but you should be careful well, in one let, way or the other let's do some math well because i love talking about designer coffee and the cost <laughs> of it so let's oh, say man. well you realize yeah. that coffee would not be seven dollars if consumers refuse to pay seven dollars for it right. actually we set the price it's not starbucks it's we do it let's because. say five dollars a day that yep. you spend on coffee and it's oh, yeah. probably being a little bit conservative yep so multiply that let's say seven days a week because you drink coffee on saturdays and sundays so you're looking at 150 dollars a month times 12 months a year don't need to calculate for this that's 1800 dollars yeah. a year mm-hmm. so talk to me about what you could be doing with that 1800 if you went to um, costco and bought the big bag of coffee yeah, for 15 dollars totally. and made yeah. your own yeah what could you do with 1800 dollars that would be thrifty and, and mindful and how much would that eighteen hundred dollars be worth if you start doing it at 20 something and now you're 65 and, and not to mention that you know that amount of money could also be earning interest right, and, right. you know and compound interest yeah and then it count that interest compounds and which compounding is essentially interest on interest but depending on how well you can invest, you could be, who knows, you know, it could be at 5%, it could be at 7%, some some point, it could be 9%, it depends, you know, but, yeah. but it, it makes a big difference. Your basic CDs are paying 4.5%. Right oh yeah, now, right now, crazy. yes. It's yeah. crazy. So, Certificate I mean, of deposits yeah. are doing really well right now, yeah. Right. Even a money amount. market fund yeah. is paying up to 5% right Just now. A savings but, account will yeah. pay you more than what it was. <laughs> yeah, right, ago, so. yeah. three yeah. years ago, it was like 0.01. Right. Yeah, 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 now it's, it's all gone up. Yeah, right. or if you, but then again, that oh man, what did I see? 
Oh, a bottle of vitamin water. I used to be able to buy those on sale at Ralph's for 88 cents on a good day. They're a buck 99 now. So on one hand, you're making 5% on your money. On the other well, hand... Well, yeah, then you've got to subtract them. Right. right. Well, that's another thing of, of why you guys need to do this is because, you know, the power of money decreases uh, due to something called inflation. So if, if you, you know, if you figure I'll just hide my money under my bed, well, you know, or under the mattress or in the piggy bank kind of thing, that's a, a bad thing philosophy yeah, yeah. you're losing money on a daily basis losing if you're doing that. Power on yeah, that yeah absolutely i mean there's nothing wrong with keeping some cash yeah you know home for emergency but the, the majority of it you want to like what bobby's saying you want to put it in something that earns interest even that eighteen hundred dollars on the coffee yeah you put I that mean, in, a, in an ira an individual retirement account and let that just sit there for let's years just say you, you save that eighteen hundred dollars a year by not getting a starbucks coffee every day and you do that for 30 years <laughs> with you could buy a car in ten years with no interest <laughs> right. whatsoever. That's fifty four thousand dollars. And it'll right. be doubled. Yeah, compounding interest. Either, and and so. when you're staring down the face of retirement, I mean, it sounds cool to retire to a trailer park in Ensenada, Mexico, because the ocean's beautiful down there. But it's probably not. You know, <laughs> I don't know about you guys. I don't want to retire in a trailer park. Neither do I. <laughs> no, 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 no. At least, if I do, I want to be that trailer park in Malibu that where yeah, they started like a million dollars for a, a trailer. There you go. Um, okay, so let's. Well, we've already talked about how musicians work for years and they hit it big. Uh, Britt, do you have any um, like three bullet points on budgeting? Because that's something. Even those of us who are fi fiscally responsible, which I thankfully count myself amongst those people. Um, I've never actually done a budget. I, I know, you know, so, I, I've got good self-restraint most of the time. I will wait years to buy something I really want, uh, uh, but wait years to get it, you know? Um, not like buy something I really want every week or every month. So do you have any bullet point tips on how to work out a personal budget? Yeah, so, so budgeting is one of those fancy words that people get scared of because it has to do with finance. Yeah. So really, as I, as I talked about earlier, budgeting is really just a process of knowing how much that you make, uh, how much that you spend, and then comparing the two and taking the difference and finding how much you have left over. Now, if you have a positive left over, meaning you, are, you have more money left over after you've paid your bills and everything, <laughs> That allows you to use it for other things like investing, which I highly recommend, savings, um, opening up an IRA, an IRA a CD, whatever it may be, um, investing in yourself. Maybe there's some equipment that you want to use that's going to help you make money down the road. That's an option, oh, too. Oh, see, that, that's a mistake, recommending that to an well, audience full of musicians. I, I recommend because it. Because that guitar will make me more money down well, the road. That piece of outboard will. No, it won't. I've never in a almost 50 year career met a piece of gear in any shape or form that ever generated a dollar more i recommend it i recommend it cautiously if you have no debt you have no problems covering your bills and your 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 current equipment is wearing out and you have to have something to keep you going if if that's generating income but yes don't go out and buy the five thousand dollar no guitar. unnecessary you're gear. right none of the yeah. none of the glamorous stuff yeah. um the other thing is is um knowing how much you are in the red if you are spending more than what you make and that can go back to your coffee example so what a budget does is allows you to see what areas that you could actually save money cut out things yeah. um and and really get to the heart of trying to at least save 20 percent of what you make that's the goal is trying to save 20 percent of what you make is if i might uh, sorry if yeah. i might add um uh you know to this it's a great uh, quote that says if you don't measure it you can't manage it so a budget is almost like getting on a scale to know like okay how much do i weigh today is my diet working is it not working so you when you're budgeting not you know working. uh <laughs> when, when when you're budgeting um you're kind of looking at what is coming in obviously and then there's a system called paying yourself first which which is highly recommended which means that you allocate a certain amount of what you have coming in is that, that's uh, going to go to rich your dad, poor dad, uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Oh, like, so many people talk yeah. about this. Yeah. And then, you know, essentially what you do is like you, you might take that money and that automatically a certain percentage will, 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 you know, you allocate specifically to maybe go into a retirement fund or to your savings or to an emergency fund, which we'll talk about later. And then you add on all your expenses. And obviously your what you make should equal 
the bottom bottom number. They have to be balanced. They have to be equal. And then when you see, you know, wait a minute, I can't save that 5% or 10% or 15% or 20% that I want to. So where could I cut off on the stuff here? Where can I make some sacrifices? Do I really need this? Do I really need that? Do I really need this? And then you can kind of just juggle your budget around a little bit. You could say, well, you know, maybe I could, instead of buying bottled water every day, maybe I can get a Brita, Brita filter or something like that. And all of these little things you do can actually make a big difference. And then yeah, as it's... Britt pointed out, you look at the end to see where you're going in the red, right? And then you make adjustments. And it's, it's more of a, budgeting is more of a self-reflection type of exercise. You really have to understand the difference between what your wants and needs are. Yeah. And when you're young, oftentimes those wants take precedence over the needs and you need to reverse that kind of thinking. What is exactly you need? and not pursue those wants right now. So it's it's hard to prioritize that as, as a young mm -hmm. person, even as an older person. Uh, how do people get out of debt? I, I'm a cash and carry kind of person. I've never had more than $5,000 worth of credit card debt, and that was only when I was unemployed once for a year did I rack that up. So I won't buy what I can't pay for out of money that I've got in the, the bank right now. Um, how do people who have student loan debt um, forget house debt, that, that, that's a whole other topic. But yeah. student loan debt, maybe they bought too much car, maybe they've racked up 10 or 20K on their credit cards. How do they dig out from under that? So it's funny you say that because um, the two most acceptable forms of debt formerly years ago were your, your mortgage yeah. and student loan debt. Right. But that's changed because student, the, the cost of tuition has gotten has skyrocketed. So now what's happening is students are coming out of college hundred two hundred thousand dollars in debt so I it's not it's almost not I don't want to say it's worth the value of it but it's not how it was 10 20 years ago so student loan debt is really not much of an acceptable form of debt anymore um, and you can't caution for those that have student loans you cannot discharge those in bankruptcy so don't even think about going the bankruptcy route really I yes, didn't know that you cannot discharge those unless you have a severe disability and you can't work then they'll consider it so um, that don't consider that but those two forms of debt aside, credit card debt is one of the worst forms of debt you can have. And I know it's hard when you're a young person to use a credit card here and there. We all do it. Um, but if you have a credit card uh, or you have more than one credit card, if you have to use one, use the one with the lowest interest rate and um, make sure you pay it off monthly. Uh, and I think we're going to get into how to improve your credit later down in the, the discussion. Um, it's good to use a credit card every now and then just to show some activity because when you are looking, it builds your, your, build your credit up. Yeah. So don't think that you get a credit card and never use it because if you never use it, it's going to become inactive and they'll close the account and it actually can hurt your, your credit. But um, getting out of debt is what the original question was. And if you have a series of credit cards, um, the best way to, to tackle that is to try and pay off the highest interest rate credit card first. What about loan consolidations? I hear that could, on the radio so all the time. I've never had to do it. Be careful with loan consolidations. You really have to read between the fine lines on the on the contract because they can start you out with a teaser rate, mm -hmm. which is really low. Hey, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll assume all of your debt if you get a, a personal loan through us or you consolidate your debt, mm -hmm. and it'll start at 4%. And at wow. the end of the year, it jumps to 21%. Right. So be careful. If you don't pay off the full balance within that first year under 4%, then after that next year, all of the interest from that year built up will compound into 21%. It, it'll put you upside down faster than you yeah. can know. So be, be careful with those loan consolidations. Typically, your big credit card companies like Discover, um, credit, uh, credit One, I mean, they, they are pretty legit with these consolidation type things. But if it's a third party, one of those uh, cash, you know, you can paycheck advance type places. Right. Yeah, don't e just keep driving. Don't even don't even bother. <laughs> the best place to see those is in your rearview mirror. So just mm -hmm. keep driving when you see that. But avoid the loan consolidation unless it's a, a hard rule that that interest rate stays the same throughout the life of your loan at a low rate. Mm -hmm. So, but there is two there is two techniques. There's the avalanche method, yep. right? There's the snowball method. Yep. You want to go? Ahead yeah. And yeah. So sure. So so. Um, Another way, instead of paying off the highest interest rate credit card first, which is, is, is great because you're going to probably save the most money that way, um, you can also... Which is the avalanche method is what right, they call it. Right. right. You, can, you can do the reverse and you can start paying off the credit card that has the lowest balance first. And what this does is you are, as you are paying off smaller balances, starting with a smaller balance, it's easier to pay off. And it actually is motivational because it mm -hmm. shows that you're paying off 
one credit card right. at a time. So it builds, it, it all becomes fun to pay them off because you see this this taking place and it's motivating. Yeah. So that's another way of, of doing it, starting mm -hmm. off with the lowest dollar credit card first. and It's like getting it. your first TV placement with a piece of music. Right. Yeah. I can do this. I can do more of this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, yeah, and that's... What was the uh, other method you, you know, mentioned? The snowball line? method. The and second one was the snowball way. method, right. And then, you know, sometimes people just have, you know, uh, savings and they're just, they don't, they don't want to part with this, that savings to actually pay, pay off debt. Oh, but that would be hard. you think about it, if you're paying like a high interest, you know, credit card loan at 18%, let's just say, for example, and you have your money in an investment that's only earning like 1% or less, then it makes sense. You're actually doing yourself a favor by taking that money and paying off the, uh, the right. debt. But people don't see it that way. I mean, but you know, knocking off debt is is one of the best things that you can do. You're essentially renting other people's money at a high cost. So you want to get rid of that. And you can always ask mom or dad. You, know, you can ask the mom and dad method. That book, the last method is ask mom or dad. Use ask the birthday card dad. money or birthday <laughs> card yeah. money that you've been saving up from grandma over yeah. over all the years. I mean. You know, if you happen to, to get like, let's just say, for example, a nice sink placement and you get three or four thousand dollars, you know, take that and, and knock it out, you know, but pay it off. I've got to yeah. say, I, I am not like super thrifty guy. I'm relatively thrifty. But, do you know, I took the money I got from my bar mitzvah, which was about fifty two hundred dollars, I think, mm -hmm. from family and relatives, family, and friends, whatever, and bought savings bonds. Good for you. Uh, when I was 13 years <laughs> old. And when they were I, worth more more money, right? And yeah, used yeah, yeah. those for the down payment on my first condo when awesome. I was like 30 years old. Oh, good for you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's only because my parents set a good example. They would have done that sort of thing. My dad used to give a, my dad for presents my, my whole life would give us savings bonds. That's that was the present that he gave us for birthdays, Christmas, you know, etc. So he was, you know, and that's another thing that we talk about in the book as well, you know, um, the barriers to personal finance. And a lot of times people uh, say, well, my, my, my parents were never into it or my family, it doesn't run Be in the my first. blood, you know? Yeah, exactly. Be the first. And you'll find that a lot of people that are very successful and are very wealthy uh, oftentimes do not come from money. It's just the opposite. They come from a, a family maybe that, that didn't really quite have it together, but did that's what motivated them. Did you ever read them. the book, The Millionaire Next Door? Mm -hmm. I did, yeah. Uh, a mm -hmm. Great book, and it talks about how many immigrant families, and I think it, one of the examples is a, a family that comes to the U.S. from China, and they had very little money, but they scraped together enough money to open a dry cleaning business, and they didn't overspend. They lived in a modest house. They drove a modest car. Exactly. They saved their money. They put it in whatever investments. Exactly. And they retired a comfortable, safe millionaire. Uh -huh. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. And there's a lot of people like that. There's a great book called, uh, you know, the the. The, the Barber, The Wealthy Barber, which is a very, very famous book, but it talks just about the same thing. Yeah. You know, if, if you have a consistent form of income that is that is coming in over the years and over the years and you do the right stuff with it, those are the people that end up doing really, really well, except you don't think so because everyone... <laughs> thinks of wealth as like you have a Bentley and you know and you're you you're you know in a speedboat in turquoise water and that's what they equate with wealth but actually the definition of wealth is not how much money you spend you know it's basically what you have your assets what you you know what you own minus what you owe is is essentially the definition of of wealth yeah. assets minus liabilities and people always look at it like what you're spending and how much how big a house you have and and you know what kind of car you have, etc. So, you know that's that's it's this is all psychological stuff that is important in personal finance. Essentially, but people are aspirational. Mm -hmm. You see somebody driving a nice car on TV, it plants a seed in your brain. I want that, and, and it's completely understandable. And little do they know they're probably renting the car and leasing the house or vice versa right. somehow. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, I I was on the finance committee for the school that two of my daughters went to and I had to sit there with lawyers and accountants every year because I was a business guy and go through the applications for um what do you call it when somebody gets free tuition? Uh, I'm drawing a blank. Remission? Scholarships, oh, yeah. Okay. And, and so I would see the personal finance of people that I knew, you know, ran into them, you know, like at science fairs and PTA meetings. 
And there were some people that had like an 8,000 square foot house in Malibu and a Mercedes and a Corvette. Mm -hmm. And, and they had no money. <clears throat> yep. They literally spent every penny, and then they would yep. come to the school saying, let my kid go right. there mm -hmm. for free. Yep. And yep. as hard as it was, they didn't know I was on the committee, but I knew them. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to screw with them, but they didn't play by the rules. A lot of people yeah. feel they have to paint a certain picture for society, and that's what gets a lot of people into trouble. I know a lot of people that make yeah. uh, huge yeah. mistakes with this, you know? Yeah. You know, so it's 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 definitely one of the, the barriers to successful personal finance is this need to actually show everybody like, you know, you know, but fake it till you make it kind of philosophy. <laughs> well, they live like there's no tomorrow and that's really mm -hmm. not, I mean, it's cool. Yeah, live like there's no, no tomorrow, but that's really, uh, you're setting yourself up for failure if, mm -hmm. if you do that because uh, most people most people will live throughout tomorrow. And if they're blowing all their hard-earned money and their cash on things like Bentleys and stuff, um, tomorrow they're going to be in a huge amount of debt and probably in bankruptcy court. So. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Now I know what everybody's thinking. It's like, damn, I want to bet yeah, me, man. Like, you I know, need to cancel like, that contract. That's the status. Uh, so we, under, we understand that. But, you know, uh, what, there's a great quote by Jay-Z that might sum this all up. He goes, <laughs> Who's a billionaire, you know, by the way. Yeah. We're right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't buy it unless you could buy it twice, right? So, wow. so there you go. Uh, oh, or, yeah. or, I, I, or three I, times. It's going to be fourteen dollars in coffee, then, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Now let's make the differentiation between people in their twenties starting out. What are, you know, the difference in the mindset and the practice of what you should do in your twenties versus somebody who's forty, fifty, or sixty? Is mm. there any hope for somebody who's fifty and hasn't been? Absolutely. 50, yeah. but not thrifty. I so, didn't yeah. plan that. That just well, rolled off the tongue. So, yes. I mean, there's, there's, it's never too late to start, you know, thinking about this stuff. It's, it's never too late. Um, I mean, certainly if, if when you're 50, you'd be much better off if you started when you were 20. But to say that it's completely all over would be, would be wrong. You know, you Is just there enough to, time you know, in the timeline to have the compound interest have well, much of an effect? The problem is, obviously, if you're 50 and you plan on retiring when you're you know, in your mid-60s or even 70, that's only 20 years. You know? So you can do something, but it's, of course, not going to be as beneficial as when you started when you were 20. Right? You don't have the benefits of the compound. Now we know why people rob you know? banks and bank robbers are always <laughs> older. No. And, of course, you, you also don't have as much of the opportunity to ride the uh, the ups and downs of the market. That's because, always been my fear. Uh, you know, um, if you start when you're 20, right, and you, yeah. it could do this, and then it goes down, but you have time to recover, and, and it always does What recover, if you're 70 you know? and the market goes that, in the dumper yeah. on your well, 69th happened. birthday? Right, yeah. that, that's that's yeah. that's the problem, because you, you started when you were 60 or 50, and, and you know, and so well, that's the danger. When you're, when you're 60, 70 years old, the investments you have, they shouldn't be risky. Anyways, mm -hmm. you should have the riskier investments when you're a little younger, where you can recover from a down market. When right. you're 60, 70 year, years old, you should be thinking more of uh, blue chip stocks and bonds, just things that are relatively safe that kind of follow the market. Nothing mm -hmm. crazy like this. What, Bobby loves this crypto currency. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he loves yeah. talking about that. <laughs> yeah, no, I only love talking about it just to be clear, uh, because you know people like the sexy, risky yeah. type of stuff. Yeah, it hasn't know? worked out that well no, for my it, friends. It has not. You know, no. anybody I yeah. know that did like 10, 20k in crypto is not yeah. happy that they no. invested. Yeah. That. These are all like sexy and and but they're cool. but they're they're cool, yeah. but they're 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 also risky. You know. Um, I've been trying so, to sell my Bobby Borg NFT, and I have yeah, no, right. no takers. Yeah, right. Isn't that crazy? I mean, like so many, so many people were just like NFTs, NFTs. Even I had young students walking around with their cell phones, like trying to invest in NFTs and stuff. And I'm just like going. Everyone wants to get rich quick. That's one of right. the biggest dangers of this, is everybody wants to become a millionaire. Everybody wants That's to get rich quick. That's the fault of the internet and media in it general. It really is, and social media particularly, because mm -hmm. yeah. everyone's showing their, you know, themselves living their best lives. or so, Showing all their so $100 called. bills that they made. On yeah. the i got to tell you, I, as right. long as I've known you, I don't think I've ever shared this story, and it's so apropos for this topic today. When I was 18 years old and I was going to college in Miami, I was flying home to my parents' house in Illinois for probably Christmas break or something. And I decided to be unthrifty, uh, and I upgraded from coach to first class at 18 right. years old yeah. on, nice. on, on like an American <laughs> Airlines flight. It was not a big deal, because it was you know, like a $200 flight, so I paid 350 or something. It, you know, it wasn't a $15,000 first class upgrade. 
I sat next to this guy that looked like the banker on the Monopoly board. <laughs> and, he, and he had, you know, like the monocle, the three-piece suit. I mean, it was a caricature of what he was, which was, he said to me, why is somebody your age with tattered jeans and a flannel shirt sitting up here in first class? And I said, I want to see what the experience was like. And he said, that was the, a really good move on your part. And I said, why? And he said, because you meet a better class of people up here. And I went, ooh, he's rich and snobby. A and he went on to tell me that he was the largest independent bank owner in the United States. I don't wow. want to say his name, wow. but I've never forgotten his name or his face and the advice that he gave me. He said, if you want to become financially stable, he didn't say wealthy said financially stable he said buy stocks in things that you use and you love right yeah so i bought yeah. apple stock warren buffett says that too yeah. as well. i bought apple yeah. stock the day the first iphone came out and somebody mm. literally day number one and somebody handed me a phone and i went swipe mm. swipe and i went yeah gotta buy some of that i called my stockbroker which i i generally would buy you know uh, mutual funds and, and you know invest a couple thousand dollars a year in mutual funds mm -hmm. And I called my stockbroker and said, I want to buy Apple stock. And it was a pretty big number by comparison to a couple thousand dollars. My uh, stockbroker said, no way am I going to let you buy a single stock. Mm. And I hung up on him. Well, and, and I bought it anyway. So far, so good. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, yeah right? it's worked out so really, far, really well. So <laughs> far, Microsoft so good. Stock as well. Yeah. No, I didn't get Microsoft. <laughs> you know, the, I didn't like Bill Gates. <laughs> buying but single stocks, Steve right, is definitely a little bit, you know, because I mean, you have to be a stock picker, and nobody is, right? Yeah. So, but with Apple, people have lucked out so far. But you know, buying, you know, putting all your eggs in one basket can be dangerous. But yeah, with Apple, I wouldn't you know, recommend it. With I, Apple, yeah. I just, people have lucked out. Yeah. If not for that guy sitting next to me, you wouldn't 18 have bought years it. Yeah. old, yeah, I never would have made yeah. that move. But I love Apple products, and Steve Jobs had just come back to the company, and mm -hmm. I thought, you know, yeah, I'm gonna. I literally said to my wife, most people would call me crazy for doing this, but let's just stick the money in there and not even look at it until our kids are like going to college or something where we need a chunk of money, that's exactly. what this is yeah. for. Yeah. And we Not, still haven't is, yeah. cashed it in. Yeah, and it's, pay, it's paid off with them. But you have to be careful because, I mean, you know, I know people that invested in BlackBerry and as a single stock. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you <laughs> and we know. know what happened to them, right? <laughs> you know, if you're yeah. going to do that, get a professional. This day trading stuff is fun. Yeah. It's right. challenging. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can you can lose a lot of money. I'm not so, so sure that uh, it's this is one of the questions I nobody came really up. knows what they're doing. Yeah, <laughs> like, and you know, life gambling is what it is. My yeah. wife and I sat down ten years ago with a certified financial planner, and after paying this guy and working with him for a couple of years, we just went, "This is goofy. We have not learned one thing from this guy that we didn't already know. Not that we are that astute on this subject. I think we're pretty average, as a matter of fact, just common sense people." And we were spending more on him than we were making yeah. from yeah. his That's advice. Yeah. But know, yet, uh, I, I know some certified financial planners that have done really well for other people. So I'm not indicting all certified financial planners. But. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, certified financial planner. You know, if, I mean, if you're if you're trying to get sort of a grip on all of this, it doesn't hurt to sit down with somebody just to kind of assess your situation and maybe make some suggestions for you. But you know, you can hire someone on an hourly basis and maybe meet with them once in a while. Um, and that might be a good idea. But if now if you're talking about getting a money manager, someone actually that's gonna manage your funds at like a 1% of all your assets, that's that can scary, get right? very expensive. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, the truth is, and this really is the truth, is, is, is nobody knows what direction the market's gonna go. There are some people that analyze and they're very, very good at analyzing, but the truth is, is nobody can over time and time and time and time again, pick it and guess it right. And that's exactly why you guys can get on some of these financial shows that you see on television and find someone that you like, right? And listen to what they're saying. And you can go back six or eight months and everything they're saying now contradicts what they said <laughs> in the past. I just know, you know, so no one really knows for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, passive, you know, passively managed funds, maybe something like an index fund, you know that the that you know matches the, the the market indices like the Standard and Poor 500. Let's just say, for example, yeah, like you a, throw a, it in. A, you don't have to touch it. You don't have to look Vanguard at it. Vanguard index right. fund will probably exactly. make you the five to seven percent 
yeah. year after year after yeah. year yeah. unless something catastrophic. And happens. these have low expense ratios. Yeah, and, and that's what Warren yeah. Buffett recommends too. Yeah, yeah. Really? he made all his yeah. money. Yeah. yeah, index funds. Index funds. Really? Yeah, yeah he does. ETF actually. and yeah. index yeah. funds. In yeah. fact, wow. he, I don't know if you guys heard about this that he did a, a, a competition with this huge like um, oh, yeah. hedge fund uh, guy. And he said, I bet you anything, you can do all your math and science and calculations and things like that. I'm going to beat you with an index fund. So in 10 years, we'll compare. Wow. And he actually won. Yeah. So, you know, and, you know, he didn't do anything. It just sat. He didn't touch it. And that person was working it every day. Buy, sell, sell, buy, buy. And he I've still got some friends them. that are retired that are probably like 68 to 75 years old and they day trade. But they, they take an amount. They say, but, like, okay, I'm going to take 10 grand and play with it because I can afford to lose the whole 10 grand. And it keeps their mind active and gives yes, them people something love to wake it. up yeah. and do yeah. what they did. People love it. There's probably some people that are angry at us right now for saying this. Well, yeah. But, you know, so, I mean, people, people clarify, love it. if you have a few bucks laying aside and you mm -hmm. have it's fun money, like money you would take to Vegas or whatnot, throw it in a, in a – you can day trade with that. Yeah, but we don't, call it funny money. Yeah, but if you're, yeah. if you're young in your 20s and it's the last – Five hundred dollars you have. Don't be day trading with that. I mean, that, that's you know, and literally, uh, it's scary. I see my like twenty-year-old students walking around with their phones, and they'll be on Robinhood or something like that with these financial apps. That was my and I next said, question. "What are you doing right now?" And he goes, "I'm checking my stock portfolio." And I go, "Your stock portfolio? You can barely remember to, to bring a pencil to your midterm." You know, it's like, are you serious? Do you have any idea what what, what, what is it? <laughs> Go what on. is a stock? Explain that to me. Uh, you know, I'm like, but you're putting down your money that you're making from your day job in the stocks. You have no idea. So you got to be careful. Do companies like Robinhood, because they've got younger investors that don't know much, maybe, um, do they have programs that basically you can make 5% compounded year after year because they kind of push you in a direction? Or I, I don't well, know anything about Robinhood. Yeah, I mean, it's basically, it's, a, it's an app that makes it easy for you to buy, uh, in, to buy into the market a lot of times because they're allowing you to buy fractional shares. So, rather so when most one people can buy Apple one share that can't afford it, right. you could buy fractions of a share. So it makes it like anyone really could get into it. The problem is, and I told Britt about this, is that I just think it's a little bit irresponsible because it makes it feel and sound so easy and yeah. all the advertisements make it sound so simple and easy. And you know, it's portable, it's on your mobile phone. And there's probably some of you guys right now that are, are actually using it. And so I just wanna be clear, we're not suggesting don't use it, but you just have to be responsible. It's, it's your money, it's, an, it's not a game. And you should never think about what we're talking about today as get rich quick strategies. Right. You should look at all of this as it's not about getting rich. It's just about securing your future, um, you know, saving for certain goals that you might have in a, in, a, in, a, in a really practical way. It's not get rich quick. It's very, very important. You know, a safe play is always to diversify your investments. Some risky, some not risky, some middle of the road. But when it comes to the, the money you have at the end of each month and you're trying to figure out what to do with it, let's say it's $200. You know, put 20% of it in a savings account, put the other 20% in a money market, put the other 20% in a CD, just spread out the different types of investing you would do with it. Uh, because some investors are gonna earn a little more, some a little less, but at the end of the day, these are all relatively safe and you're not locked into one type of investment too. So the money you have at the end of each month, you can segregate into different types of investments mm -hmm. as well. I've got a tip, not a certified financial planner, not a professional, it's just my personal advice, and that is when you do invest, if you have the ability to put it in an IRA, I didn't do that when yeah. I bought mm -hmm. that Apple oh, yeah. stock. Well, that's the, yeah. Big, big, big mm -hmm. mistake. I'm going to pay so much more when I cash those Apple shares in yeah. because I didn't put it in IRA. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely any, any you know, we, we suggest um, that, that the well, the first thing that you, you obviously should do is, you know, create a budget so that you can actually start taking a certain amount of your money, whether or not it's 5% or 2% or 10% or 20%, you know, and, and you can start thinking about this stuff. But first and foremost, you want to get out of debt, of course, right? Because you're paying those high interests and you're renting someone else's money. Right. And once you do that, you want to take money and you want to put that into an emergency fund, right? So that when your car breaks down, you know, you, you're prepared for those unexpected situations. 
right? So everybody should have an emergency fund. The next thing, obviously, how much should they have? So I was just gonna say, yeah, how, how much of an emergency fund? Yeah, so and is it age dependent? Because you know, yeah, at sixty-five, wanna, you might need an emergency fund to wanna, cover medical <laughs> stuff. I don't want to alarm your 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 crowd here, your audience, but an emergency fund minimum should be six months of living expenses mm -hmm. saved up. That's what they minimum. say. Yeah. Yeah. But yet the government just came out. Uh, I heard something on the radio there, and I'm not even going to attempt to quote a number because I'll screw it up. But it was enough to make you want to pull, make me the other night pull off the road and throw up because I there's so many Americans that don't even have a 30 day supply of money. No, so right? They got they fired not. tomorrow. Oh, that's horrible. They Most Americans like, are living paycheck to paycheck. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's yep. horrible. So I how the heck do you have way. an emergency fund? Yeah, you just have to. Yeah, yeah, this this is you, discipline, and you have to do it. I mean, I have a friend that's got half a million dollars as, a, as an as an emergency fund, right? So. I'm you know, available but, but, for yeah. adoption. But, but for you, <laughs> it could be it could be uh, you know two thousand dollars, you know three thousand. I mean, it's wise to do it obviously because what happens is when people run into emergencies, they go back to the credit card, right? And you're renting someone else's money again. So after you do that, then you have to start taking advantage of your retirement accounts because the government is providing us opportunities to essentially at the end of the day save on taxes whether or not it's because you're lowering your tax bracket and you're paying less in taxes every year or you're allowing your money to to grow tax-free so when you take it out you're not taxed so either way you're crazy if you're not taking advantage of these of these things that the government gives us and why do they give it to us because i guess it doesn't make any sense to have a bunch of old people living in in, in tents at, in, uh, at the age of 70, you know, in their older age. So they're giving you an incentive to, to, to save. So you're crazy. After you do that, now, of course, your retirement funds are going to have investments that you can buy in the retirement accounts, right? But then after that, you can have your, your own individual or taxable accounts. Um, and that's when you can maybe sort of have a little bit more freedom because the retirement accounts do offer a number of different investments, but a lot of times they don't offer as, as many as you can if you just have your own, let's just say, taxable account. So first you want to max out those retirement accounts first and foremost. And some people don't even do that. You know, um, and what's at the my difference age, between I, like a, a, an IRA or IRA and a Roth IRA? Yeah. Um, so it's, it depends. I mean, so essentially is one generally better for the average person than the other. I, I do both. And yeah. the reason why is because it, it's a question of do you want to save on your taxes now right. or do you want to uh, save on them later? So which brings me to a question. So I just do both. As soon as I saw Brit's bio, I wanted to ask you this question. What uh, when the certified financial planner or any sort of investment professional says this is tax deferred? What exactly does tax deferred mean? It just means you're going to pay taxes on it later. Well, what's the big deal? So, okay, let's say so, grandma dies and I inherit twenty thousand um, dollars, and I'm going to stick that in some sort of investment that's going to defer the taxes. Um, is there any advantage to, I would just deal with the pain now and pay the taxes, but clearly I'm wrong and because usually, the certified financial planner said you, always go for tax deferment when you can. I never really understood usually that. Usually that would be the right thing to do if you're at a later stage in your life. But if you're younger yeah. and you come into money like that, you have the opportunity, you can pay taxes on it now and your investment will be smaller. So you've, you've got, the full, so you've got the full 20 grand to make that's the going to compound with. that interest over 20, 30 years until you retire. So, so it doesn't it change the tax rate. Let's say you're, you're going to pay 30. You're going to pay it eventually. Well, unless the tax rate goes up. So we don't, well, you know. Right. So. You're talking about money that was left to you. But if we're talking about oh, your, yeah. your income, then yes, it can lower your tax bracket. Right. If money's left to you, that's a whole yeah. thing. I misspoke about that because so, that's so, a different different kind of tax. So let's say you make $100,000 a, a year um, and you're taxed at the highest rate, which is right about 27% right now. Unless um, you live in California. Yeah, there's right, another exactly. 10 on top of that. All that. Yeah. Um, if you decide to contribute to a retirement plan, uh, the money that you are contributing comes off your gross income. So your gross right. income will now show $80,000 a year. And you're going to be taxed ah. at a lower bracket because you're, it shows that you're making less, that your taxable income is less. So that's one of the benefits, of a huge benefit of these retirement plans is it lowers your taxable income off the top. The, what you are getting at is, do I go into a retirement plan with money going into it has already been taxed or will it be taxed when I, 
when I withdraw it, when I retire. It all depends on, like I said, where you are in life. If you're a little younger, you're probably going to, going to want to invest pre-tax dollars. Okay. So it grows. If you're older like us, it might make sense to go ahead and pay taxes now, and then we don't have to worry about paying taxes when we pull it out, even on the profits. So there are good and bad things about mm -hmm. each one. Let's talk about when you inherit money. Um, wills That's and trusts. I mean, it's expensive to hire an attorney. My yeah. wife and I had to do one because I own a company. I've got four kids. Uh, we own a house, so we did a trust and a will. You definitely and, need and, that. and you have to redo it every. It's setting up a will and trust when your kids are in primary school is one thing, and now your kids are twenty something. That's a whole other thing. So you have to go in and spend several thousand dollars to adjust all that stuff because the kids' needs are going to change when they're little. If you and your wife, God forbid, perish in a car accident, a plane crash or something, and you both go yeah. once, you want that money to go with the kids to whoever you've designated to take care of your kids. Oh, while they're trustee. Still, uh -huh. Yeah. And, and so that's a, a different can of beans, can of worms, whatever, um, than when the kids are 30 and they might inherit that money. So do you guys have any great advice for people who have not yet set up a will uh, and or a trust and along so, with that question what about things online where you know do a trust online or for two hundred dollars so, versus six thousand dollars to hire an attorney mm -hmm. do those work so wills and trusts are used interchangeably typically uh, for someone that's young you're not going to need a, a trust just yet because a trust is the umbrella that, that holds all of your assets yeah and usually in your 20s you don't have a lot of assets yet however a will is just basically a statement of where do you want your, who do you want your property to go to? Right. So it's important to start off with a will when you're young because you might have a, a savings account, you might have a couple of investments, and if you were to pass away, it'd be nice to be able to leave that to a loved one or a friend. So there's nothing wrong with writing a will or get, having an attorney draft up a, a, a will with what little you have, but as you grow and become successful in your career and hopefully in, in music and you make hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, and as you acquire assets, you then want to consider creating a trust because that's what's going to hold and protect all of your assets. Which would be really important. You know what? We have taxi members that are making 50, 100 grand, a few that make a couple hundred grand a year. Yep. Um, <clears throat> they have intellectual property. Yep. That if that, they passed away tomorrow, that should go to somebody. That so should that, be in a trust, too, because yeah. mm -hmm. it protects it. Um, but yes, and again, the will part of it, yes, it should go to someone, wife, child, whoever it may be. So they go hand in hand, but but like I said, you typically want to start off with a, with a will first, especially when you're young, because you haven't accumulated all of those assets yet. And as you grow... And don't leave your guitar to your wife, because she's going to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, finally, I, I get to buy that I little diamond tennis thing. bracelet. Yeah. <laughs> but the most important thing is please seek out an attorney um, uh, or someone that's an expert in setting up, uh, setting up trusts. They're very complicated, the way they work tax code yeah. and everything. So really um, complicated. don't just take the advice of what you read online. Uh, consult a financial expert and a, uh, a lawyer. How do you know when you've got a good financial expert? Because my experience is that I, I've had several. I've, I've had a couple. Uh, yeah, and, and yeah. Um, we just fired the most recent one a year and a half ago. It's like, dude, we made more money by taking 5,000 bucks and putting it in a Vanguard, uh, I think the fund was VGT, yeah, right. yeah. and just leaving it in there, then you made it. Yeah, so in, in the book we talk about, uh, there's a whole chapter on how to find a CPA, how to find an accountant. There's also um, a whole chapter on how to find uh, a financial planner or money manager. So, uh, I mean, speaking from personal experiences, I mean, I can tell you some nightmare stories and I can tell you some great stories. I mean, so essentially, um, I, I would say the first thing you want to do is you obviously want to go with someone that comes recommended, you know, so speak with somebody that you trust, speak with someone that you like and just say, hey, who do you have as an accountant, you know, or, or, or certified financial planner and how do you like them and have they been they, they done well for you, right? At least start with that first and foremost. And then when you walk in, you know, obviously, you know, I think most young people are concerned with the price. So first and foremost, so, you know, is it possible that you charge maybe a flat rate to, let's just say, for example, do my tax return? Because that would be the first thing that you probably do. 
um, and see if you can get them to agree on like, yes, it's going to be $400 to do your taxes and it's going to be no more than that. <laughs> and you're going to write a check for $400 and we're going to do your tax returns and this is what we're going to give you at the Which end. Which I'm a fan of using a professional to do tax returns uh -huh. rather than trying to do it yourself. Yeah, sure. They are no, always going to find you more money. Yeah, than typically, you will yeah. Especially if you find someone that you feel comfortable with and you don't have to deal with all the stress of the different rules that might change. And, you know, you do have to work together with your accountants. So yeah. you're going to have to keep all your tax receipts together and that type of thing. But I would say that's going to be the first two things you want to do get a recommendation, and then see if you can get someone with a flat price. Because I have had nightmares where people tell you it's a flat rate and then all of a sudden they're calling you up and asking you questions and you see it's not $400, it's $750 because they're charging you for all the phone calls and they're charging you for Each form. Uh, every <laughs> form. And, and yeah, so this, there's been some some nightmare situations. As far as the, chief, uh, the certified financial planner, I've had some good situations and bad ones. And typically speaking, you know, when you, again, find someone that's recommended and then when you walk into the office, if they're sitting there telling you how they're going to, you know, they can pick stocks and how they're going to make you rich really fast. And they're, you know, one guy walked in and he came in with the suit and the big Rolex watch and he flings his, his keychain across the table to show me he has a BMW. And I'm like, no. F cares. I mean, you know, and he's talking to me about who he knows. Nowadays, and stuff. BMWs are, are, was, are, are, uh, on the grand, you know, on the totem pole. It, it, yeah, Maserati, yeah, Ferrari, yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. But I was just like, you know, so it, it was so you know, just someone that's showy and, and talking about how they're going to make money and this. So they never really give solid answers and. You know, you have to kind of feel it out, go with your gut. And there's so many other different things that we talk about, but it probably wouldn't make sense to go through every, uh, you know, point in this book right now. But or just people could speaking, just buy it. By the way, we are yeah. going to give one of these away in a few Oh, yeah, minutes. for sure. So yeah. I think one important thing that, that Bobby was touching on is when you're seeking out an accountant or a, a certified financial planner, with regards to most of your audience, try to find one that is used to handling clients in that business, in that industry, mm -hmm. that has the music experience that's or the artist advice. experience. Absolutely. Because you could go to an accountant that's never done taxes for an artist. And I know in, in that industry, it's a lot different. You're 1099 a lot and you're not W2, and it just gets confusing. So an accountant that's never dealt with something like that before yeah. uh, could be disaster. Just to them. Which gear clients. can you yeah. write off? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. For instance, I learned one year. I bought a suit that was like six hundred dollars to wear, probably to a taxi road rally. I found I couldn't deduct that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a business expense because I bought it for the sole purpose of wearing it at the convention. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh. Mm -hmm. Actors can't even deduct. You know, if if they wear their own wardrobe, they cannot deduct that. Right. But uh, that microphone. That was a deduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't understand. They're they're both part and parcel to me, running this company. But clothes. You know. Right. And they'll tell you, you know, what you can, they'll help you with what you can deduct and what you can't. So, I mean, the best bet would be obviously to be, to individually have great work habits, you know, yeah. have a record kicking system where you know how to keep receipts and you know what you should keep and what you shouldn't keep and that they're filed accordingly. And then you even have to be very, very careful with that because if you get audited, the IRS oftentimes is going to want to see the actual receipts. And if you're just throwing them in a drawer and what happens is receipts get mildewy and <laughs> Seats actually start to fade, and that will not they be able fade. to count. You, do you have literally, one of those little scanner things where you just shove it in you, there? You can on, do that, but yeah. check this out. You might say, here's my digital file of all my receipts. I know from experience, they want the real receipt. So You're even right. if you have Most the digital Most of them fade copy, after six months that's right. because and I, of the way yeah. the printers print them now. And I personally oh. asked the IRS, I said, but they fade, there's mildew. And they go, well, deal with it. So now what I do is I basically lay them all out. I put a plastic sheet on it. I mean, it's oh a pain gosh. in the butt. But if you get audited, it's worth it, especially if you get what's called an in-person audit. Yeah. Yeah. Or I beg your pardon, a book audit. That's where you have to send everything to them. That's a complete nightmare. Oh my god! And make yeah. sure your tax account will represent you in an audit as well. You know, yeah, very important. Yeah. I told Bobby on the phone the other day or in an email. I fire my accountant every seven years as a general practice, <laughs> and and the reason I do it is the first year they do a good job and show you what a good job they did for you. The second year, pretty good job. 
By the third or fourth year, they're now handing the work off to an associate who basically just uses a computer program and they take last year's return and go, oh, you made $3,000 more this year and do a little bit of right. fine tuning, yeah. but they still charge you the $700 or whatever it costs to do it. I had an accountant that missed a $93,000 deduction one year. Wow. Yeah. And wow. he goes, wow, I can't believe you caught that. And I said, yeah, thank God I caught it. Uh, it was they let some, you amend that, right? Yeah, yeah, but it was a big pain in the butt, and, and you're raising eyebrows at the IRS yeah, when you come in and say, sure. I can't remember what it was. But no, it was, I was going to ask. <laughs> it was some business thing, some tax that some, we qualified for some, here yeah. at Taxi that was a new thing, and, and he didn't know about it, just forgot to put You know, I actually brought it to his attention probably a month before he did the return, and he still blew it. So that right. goes to you saying that get somebody who's in your industry because the that tax code, really understands nobody it. could know the whole tax code for any state yeah. or right. or the yeah. Fed. Um, and at least if they do a lot of musicians, what they've done for musician number one might be the same thing they do for two, three, 27, and 58 as well. Yeah, you really want to do this. And and listen, this is what I told you know the IRS. I said, look, you guys give us the opportunities to write certain things off, right? So I am very well going to take advantage of every single one of those. Um, and, uh, and, and I mean, certainly it could even be something like I remember going to Blockbuster because I would rent movies to listen to the soundtrack, yes. which is uh, especially if I'm consulting people about soundtrack work and such. So they wrote that off as, as research. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, there's a lot of things that you can write off. It definitely does help to have somebody that's in the music industry because they'll understand those specific things and they'll ask you questions as you're doing your return they go did you do any of this did you go to the nam show this year did you pay for any conventions you know in fact you can actually write off your own tax account as well so yep as an expense so, yeah. your airfare to the road rally and another, yeah. a little, a little yeah. trick that you might consider it when you're looking for a tax accountant um uh, when you're looking at their credentials, uh, this like my former accountant, he's he's retired since then, but he was great. He worked for the IRS 15 years prior, so he had IRS and auditing experience with the IRS. So, so he, he knew certain loopholes and things yeah. I could I could take advantage of. So that always helps. That don't, won't always be the case. You won't always be able to find someone that had experience prior experience with the IRS. But it, it's good to have that in your back. You know, pocket. another big one that I want to bring up, which is well, which you kind of did bring up, but I want to definitely emphasize it. Will you go to somebody, ask them, are you going to be the one that does my taxes yeah. or are you just going to basically hand, it, lease, off. hand yeah. it off to somebody else that you pay a hundred dollars and i'm paying you four hundred dollars because you have a nice office right. i've got so to tell you, be careful of that one because next that does time you're ready to i'm change. sorry if i'm pissing off any cpas out there so our <laughs> current cpa i love this guy i met him in the parking lot here in the taxi office complex probably 15 years ago Hey, how you doing? Good morning. You know, long day kind of conversations. Eventually, I hired him because the guy is here till eight or nine o'clock. If I work on Saturday, which I work a lot of Saturdays, he's in the park. I see his car in the parking mm -hmm. lot for like 12 hours on a Saturday. Sunday, this guy is a workaholic. So yeah. I hired you him. Liked him. <laughs> I love this guy and he right. does the work. Yeah, good. And yeah. he's expensive. There's no getting around that. He's very expensive unbelievably knowledgeable he's kind of like a bit of a savant you know it's like <laughs> I, I don't know so i feel very lucky so if you're ever ready to change i've, I've had about three or four good years of this guy so. oh good so you're not at yeah. year seven yet yeah i yeah, know right, but right, i told yeah, him right. when i hired him i said i, I routinely years. fire accountants on year seven because it yeah. becomes routine to them when an accountant calls you up and has joy in their voice that you're getting audited it's time to fire them. They, they, there are some accountants that don't like, if you make more than they do, they mm. resent that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some people, yeah, no, you know, not yeah. all of them. Well, they, people. they, you know, and th and this is dangerous as well, you know, and this should not happen. But typically, when somebody looks at what you make and they decide that that's what they're going to charge you for their yeah. fee, right. and that is definitely something that's obviously not cool, right? No. So you know, there is something I might mention that would help those that make less than fifty-eight thousand dollars a year, and that's the Voluntary Income Tax Assistance mm -hmm. Program, VITA. Mm -hmm. which the I've IRS, never even heard of this. Yeah. VITA yeah. provide or uh, the IRS through VITA provides free tax preparation for people who do not make more than fifty-eight um, thousand dollars. What about are, it, what about it, is that combined? 
you know, like total income for the household income. Of that's you. Si- that's single. I mean, okay, married so, goes up slightly. Um, okay, to another, gotcha. But um, it's a service that the IRS provides, and they usually set up um, shop at, at local facilities like college campuses. They'll have a VITA program going. Isn't that like hiring um, Hannibal Lecter to have a prepared right, dinner for right, you? Right. Well, <laughs> but but you know you know walking you know walking out of there that your taxes are are as good as they're going to get. You're not going to. They're not going to come back and audit you, or you're not going to owe. You don't think that they, I mean, I, I'm taking you at your word, but right. just to play devil's advocate, you don't think that these guys are like ah, another sucker. I told them that this works and it doesn't because yeah, they people, work for the IRS. It's free. People, right? people worry about that, but but mm-hmm. when not to not to sound bad about people that don't make more than fifty eight thousand dollars a year, but typically those are the clientele. They won't have many assets. They won't have so many deductions or write-offs. It's pretty just a, a straight W-2, 1040, perhaps even a 1040 easy form that's going to be filled out. So um, they're, they're virtually... Simple, straightforward. Yeah, simple yeah. and straightforward. So there's not going to be much leeway there. But it's, it's a good free service. Mm-hmm. I know students that take advantage of it all the time, and oh, I've heard good. very very good things from them about it. No one's gotten, you know, messed over by it, and it's, it's a free yeah. service that the IRS provides. It's called VITA, V-I-T-A. Uh-huh. Yeah, so I mean, if, if, if you need to get your taxes done and you're nervous about doing it yourself, that's definitely an opportunity. And then again, if, if like you have a very, very simple life, a lot of times, you know, TurboTax, you know, I mean, my, my younger brother, you know, makes over that amount, but still uses TurboTax because... I use TurboTax. Uh, sorry? Some, I use TurboTax. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so so some people get comfortable with doing it as well. I do not. I actually have my own a CPA. And the reason why is because I just have so many different things. My contractor work, independent contractor work, you know, and it's just, I'm just like, you know what? you know you do it i'll yeah. just give you really good records but i don't want to mess with it because there's nothing worse than getting an audit you know and just i've been through a couple yeah past both of them yeah i can't tell you how much the accountant made while i was being audited. it's, it's not fun when you're yeah. a, a business and you get audited first i was audited by the feds came up clean then got audited by the edd which is the state of california mm-hmm. They're the devil incarnate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Those, they make the IRS look like a bunch of lightweights. Wow, really? Yeah. No, I'd rather enjoy Jesus. doing my taxes. I kind of like it. It's <laughs> fun. It's, really? like, it's like a puzzle. It's like you're trying to find a piece that's going to help you the most. And mm-hmm. as long as you stay within the guidelines, mm-hmm. you're good. I just it's, it's just met like you, a, and I so badly want to say, get a no. life. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I only enjoy doing it once a year. I wouldn't want to All do right. it every day, but it's kind of fun certain degree I, I love the fact that the accountant that i've had now for three or four years he actually gets off on this stuff he's really into some it. people are very into it yeah, yeah for sure i, I, yeah, I love this man can't say enough stuff. good stuff about him by the way um i've actually thought about having him on the show but these guys are covering all the topics um would you guys like me to see if I could get my... It would be a great uh, show. You should do it. I'm thinking about for the because road about, rally yeah, to have yeah. him do a you know, CPA for musicians. Yeah, but yeah. then again, he's a California CPA. Because, but think about like all of the deductions a lot of people don't know about, right? <laughs> yeah. These are all things that, that are, are worthwhile. See, yeah, people are making fun of you there, Brett. They're going, tax is fun. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> Did you need to leave in an hour, or you were just no, asking? Because no, no, no. yeah, you yeah, yeah. texted me and said it's an hour, right? And I'm like, oh no, 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 no. no, no. So I, he's got an event at seven, I think. Right? Yeah, but yeah. I can stay for, for yeah. a little okay. bit. Yeah. Um, let's give a book away, and then let's do some Q and A. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So here's the deal, you guys. Don't start typing plus ones just yet because it's not fair to everybody else. But when I say go, um, type in a plus one and whoever Liz gets by running her finger up and down the chat room list um, will get the book and then you'll have to email her to tell her where to send it. All right, so one, two, three, go. All right. And there is the book, Personal Finance for Musicians by these two gentlemen right here. Yeah. You know, I do want to tell you guys that we're really, really proud of this book. We put a lot of research uh, into this book, spoke with a lot of different people, and it's written in such a clear and easy, understandable style, and everything is broken down into short little bits. The chapters are three or four pages long. Skimming through it a little yeah. bit yesterday, yeah. I noticed yeah. that it's the kind of book, and then I found it says that somewhere on the book. It says, you don't yeah. have to read this cover to cover. Oh, yeah. You can, it's like Any Robin, chapter. Yeah, yeah. Robin 
Robin Frederick's books yeah. are written that way for songwriters, yeah. where you can just like go, I'm having a hard time with a rhyme scheme, and look up rhyme scheme right, and go exactly. to that. So yeah. this it's is, not written like a book where you have right. to read chapter one in order right. to figure out chapter two. It's like you could literally open up chapter 28 and read it. And I'm glad you, glad you said that because that's another thing that scares people away from finance is terminology. They yeah. see these big, yeah. big 50 cent words and that just turns them off and they go yeah. away. So this is all simple. Yeah. Uh, layman's terms, finance. I've read a number of finance textbooks, and and I, I understand how boring that that can get. But this book is a very easy to read. Uh, you know, a high school student could read it and get yeah. get a lot out of it. Mm-hmm. Perfect so, for me. It's everything you should have learned about in high school. Yep. But, but I love it. Here's a personal monthly budget. Um, you know what? People hear the word budget. They don't know how to they structure that. that. Yeah. You know, they just think, well, I mean, as Bobby said, it's what you make versus what you got left over, and and the stuff in the middle is your budget. Um, I have a, an adult child that I would say is not as thrifty or careful with her money as I am. And I've said to her, just do a budget so you know how much you can spend. Yeah. And, and she's so, like, yeah. I, I don't know how to do a budget. So, like, well, you know, there you go. Yeah, it's, it's in the book. It's so simple. And, you know, it, this is life stuff. So it, it, it's very, very important. And it yeah. doesn't, budgeting doesn't necessarily mean, uh, you know, people think of a budget as like, you know, suffering. Yeah, it, it like shouldn't a, be thought of like that they're being way. restrained somehow. Yeah, yeah. Just, the handcuffs just, are coming. You just have yeah. your, when you when you have your mind on your money and your money on your mind. You you basically Whoa, as, there's <laughs> a bumper sticker as Snoop Dogg actually yeah, said. Right? Uh, yeah, um, you ba- you you, when you really, have your you know money on your mind and your money, and your money <laughs> on your mind. You actually respect money a lot more when you see what's coming in. You see what's going out. You'll start to respect it a lot more. You know. Um, is, and it's so it's important. Marion Laird won. Awesome. The perfect person. Marion, I'm so happy that you won this. Um, honestly, I, I really look forward to reading this in earnest. Uh, all I did Sunday, and I was careful. I was going to start dog-earing, pa- dog-earing pages that I could use for questions today. And I said to Bobby, can you send over some suggested yeah. topics? And yeah. he did. So. These are the most common questions anyway, typically, you know. And I want to let you guys also know that Britt and I have a series of videos on uh, my YouTube channel as well, youtube.com slash Bobby Borg. So youtube.com slash Bobby Borg. There's a bunch of little one-minute shorts on there, and there's a couple other longer ones as Fun well. Videos. We're going we're gonna to do more yeah. as well uh, for you guys, so Fun you videos. can always go there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How did they determine Marion when the book was? How did they? How um, did they do Liz uh, is the show producer in, okay, in, so in another office, and okay. she just literally shuts her eyes and runs her finger up oh, and down the chat room and goes, "Bink," and wherever her finger lands is the winner. Yeah, I wonder whether or not doing something like this at the rally would be would be cool. Um, I would love to have you. Um, great if me and you want to do a, a class, maybe Michael will let us do something. Um, wouldn't be, it's a good time to remind me about that because I'm yeah. literally working on yeah. the rally yeah. as we speak. Um, don't forget the Taxi Road Rally coming right up November 2nd through the 5th here in Los Angeles. You know, you've been hearing about it for years. Can I afford the plane ticket? Oh, Can I get those days off work? Yeah. Yet you keep seeing these quotes from people that say it's yeah. life-changing. It yeah. is. I, I, yeah. You know what? We don't charge for it. Where else are you going to get a world-class event like this for no money? Yeah. I'm, not, <coughs> I'm, I'm not, you know, this is... This is uh, I'm saying this from my heart. I've been to a lot of the different conventions and seminars and, and, and things. You've got to come to the Taxi Road Rally. It's an amazing experience, particularly because everybody is so loving. I mean, it's like a, a, a family of people that everybody is so supportive. It's just, it's a yeah, really, really... it's not really, competitive at all. No, it's Other not Other conventions, it's yeah. like... Dude, you call that music? Yeah, no, at the no, road no. rally, it's like it's, people are Let so me show supportive. you how to get it right so that you can make money with that. Yeah, music. I mean, it's it's my favorite actually uh, conference. To be honest with you, it's, it's it's you definitely have to come out. And if you do, uh, I'll see you there. I'll be there for sure. So. And our first question, because we're now open for the questions, and please type in the word "question" in all caps so I can spot them easily. I'm going to move this over a little bit so that I can see my whole face. Um, is from Edmund Red. The registrations on the second night, uh, or on the second, right? Yes, it's on Thursday night, November second. Correct. I mean, you could show up Friday morning. Unfortunately, people show up at like five minutes to nine, and we get started in the ballroom at nine o'clock. 
so people end up in a line of you know 50 or 100 people uh, Friday morning and they miss the keynote so there you go uh, all right other questions for these gentlemen and Bobby promised me the person that asked the best question, he's going to give them a check for $1,000 oh, wow. to get nice started on their investment. I didn't know that. Good one, Bob. <laughs> I'm kidding. If you want to join the podcast on this side and try to win that $1,000. <laughs> Andre Stefani is going to book his private jet. Private jet. Me too, Andre. Nice. I'm so excited. Andre has wanted to come, but COVID screwed up the whole travel thing between Canada and the U.S. Oh, no. And Andre's never been to a rally. So I, I personally will be there waiting for you in the lobby to give you a hug when you arrive. Oh, yeah. for you. Yep. All right. Uh, this question is from Super Blonde. Is there a difference in finance for musicians versus classical musicians? Oh, yes, classical musicians are treated much more fairly. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, listen, the, it's, the book is called Personal Finance for Musicians, right? Because essentially we took the topic of personal finance and made all of the examples relate to musicians. You just, if I wanted to, I could rewrite that book. I can go personal finance for chefs and I could actually just take the <laughs> examples and put examples that relate to a chef's life. Note to you self. Know, right. Talk to Bobby about <laughs> you know I might personal have, you know, finance for small business owners in the industry, in the music industry. There you go. There might be a line of these books for literally everyone, personal finance for a teacher. I mean, it's the same stuff. It applies literally to everybody. With but, the exception of you know, writing off your musical gear, maybe. Well, you know, you, you, yes, but, that, but, that's but what I mean. But a chef could write yeah. off their knives. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. The, the, the topics are the same except then the examples, right? The examples yeah. about what you can write off for, for musicians. And also, uh, you know, the book is Personal Finance for Musicians because it's a line of books that I have. I have Business <laughs> Basics for Musicians, Music Marketing for Musicians, Introduction to Music Publishing for Musicians. So Personal Finance for Musicians, it's kind of like a, a Bobby Borg brand kind of thing. And I'd rather be more niche market than just write a personal finance book because musicians, first and foremost, is where my heart is because I'm a musician, first and foremost. So. Yes, it's for everybody, absolutely. So Marion Laird, who actually won the book, has a question. Do you have any tips on health care for musicians, especially oh my gosh. when right. close That's to or after retirement that. age? Yeah. Oh, Did you mean, see? oh, health care. I thought you meant like staying physically fit. I was going to no, say, no. yes, no, like let's do it. No, no, she's talking, uh, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, essentially, um, having health insurance just in general, I mean, typically speaking, most people get health insurance obviously from their job, right? So take advantage of health insurance from your job. But if you're saying that you don't have a job or you're no longer work, or working. You're an independent, you're you know, a musician who, who yeah. gigs for a living. You don't have I health insurance. Recently, I mean, so right. So if you're an independent contractor and you need insurance, I mean, I recently um, was looking into California covered, right? And, um, and you know it can be expensive actually to get really good insurance and so i mean but there's 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 really no other choice unless maybe you have a spouse and you can get on your spouse's work you know plan yeah but um you know essentially there, you had a, a an incident years and years ago we Oh yeah, your yeah. Covered that. Too. So if you're talking about, so basically, yeah, it was a workers' compensation yeah. issue. So I was out on the road, and I actually got hit by a, a truck. I know this is going to sound funny, but I got yeah, hit it's by always a truck. funny when somebody yeah. gets hit by a truck, Bob. And I got a pulmonary <laughs> embolism. Most people laugh when I say that. Wow. Which basically, a pulmonary embolism means that I had a blood clot in my lung, which was ready to explode. Which From means, the accident? Yes. Which because basically it was a, a, a knee injury, and then oh, the blood clot came up, up. Oh. traveled up, which means I very very easily could not be here, right? But thank God I am. But I was in the hospital for about a week and a half and there were like, and then Coumadin blood thinners for like six months and going in and out of the, of the hospital. And, you know, that was covered as a result of, of the workers' compensation insurance because uh, I was out on the road working with someone, so it was covered. Wow. Um, so, yeah. And, and, and I, why did you walk in front of a truck? Yeah, I know. It's a, it's, a, it's a long story. We're coming back from a gig and we're crossing uh, back over into New Jersey. So New Jersey, you know, should say it right there. Someone was basically playing chicken with us, basically like, you know, like get out of my road, so to speak. And they, it was a hit and run. So, uh, kind of and the guy came, never got caught. Yeah, he came right to us. He came right at us. I ran this way. He came that way. 
it, it hit us and just kept on going. Yeah. So I think it was it was, it was definitely intentional. So wow. So that yeah. that question was specific for health insurance. Was yeah. It? yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and, so. Or the guy really didn't like drummers. <laughs> Just or say. didn't like the band, right? right. <laughs> um, we were on tour. Was that when there were a couple uh, with more Warrant questions. at that time? Oh uh, yes, it was actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question from Bob Frederick. Uh, ask a new artist songwriter: Is there a benchmark that you need to meet before claiming your work is a business compared to a hobby that's uh, a great question yeah. should you ask your cpa because yeah a lot of people you know i i started another small business really small business a couple of years ago and, and spent probably five thousand dollars in startup costs doing all the contractual work and stuff but you can't deduct that until you've got income yeah. against it uh, yeah. but what about the more specifically this question um, I, I could tell you right now that yeah. my account, I mean, like if you're not, if you're, if you're, you know, have a business and you have income coming in and, and it's continually, you're taking a loss on that business for up to three, three years, four, three you years. know, years. Yeah. Essentially your, your CPA is going to, going to say, well, you know, the IRS might look at this as being a hobby because you're not a profitable business, you know, because I mean, anyone could just say, oh, I'm going to go into the photography business and buy a bunch of cameras and they're just doing it for fun. And then they're they're trying to. What about to, if you they've know, got some yeah. clients and they well, you know right. let's say they invested ten grand in equipment, another three thousand dollars in ancillary expenses, and they generated thirty two hundred dollars in revenue shooting a couple yeah. of weddings. So so then you could write off all that stuff, but if after continually a number of years you're not profitable, so then they can, might say interesting. So yeah. you can write stuff off if you're not profitable in the beginning. You just can't get away with it for very Correct. long. There's a statute involved. Mm -hmm. So um, depending on your location, certainly ask your CPA what that might be as well. Interesting. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, are the concepts universal or more directed to American musicians? Um, and that was reposted from Edmund Red, who doesn't live in America. Oh, you're right. So that's a good question. I mean, I admittedly, um, when I do, being that I obviously live in the United States and being obviously that the United States uh, arguably is the entertainment capital of the world, meaning actually more recorded music is sold in the United States than anywhere else, I tend to write my books leaning towards um, the demographic of the yeah. United States. Um, but that being said, you know, certain principles, of course, do apply to no matter where you live. Uh, I think where, where we have the main issues of difference is when you're thinking about retirement accounts or your, your you know, tax issues and things of that nature uh, was where you, you need to be the most concerned with there being a difference. What if you live in communist China, let's say? Oh, my <laughs> Lord. <laughs> you're, not a musician. Yeah. You're, not, you're not a musician if you're living in communist China. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, a couple more here. Uh, regarding receipts that you get from e-purchases, would the IRS consider a printed receipt from your printer an original? I save my electronic receipts in a folder. Would these be okay? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this Bobby is, goes, this I'm is, punting you know, this they, one they, to, You know what, the IRS, yeah. the IRS has really cracked down on a lot of e-purchasing over the last years, where you, years ago you could get away with buying something if it was out of state. Right. Uh, you, you weren't taxed on it, but progressively they've gotten you know, a little worse and worse where they're, they're catching people that, that do this. So to answer your question, save your, your email that you get from the company that you typically has the printed invoices and attachments. Save that email so you can confirm that it did come from them. Save the e-receipt as well. And if you want to print it and put it in a folder, that's always a backup in case your computer crashes or you lose your email or something like that. Mm -hmm. so, so yes to, to, to every question that you, you asked. Um, I could tell you that, that when, when I go to my CPA every year, you know, I mean, I, I buy tons of, of books for research purposes and that type of thing. I'll, I'll go to my Amazon account and I'll, you know, print, you know, the receipt and I fold them up and I give them to my accountant. Wow. And my accountant has never said, um, you know, this will not work. And in fact, I remember when I did get an audit, I, I sent those to the IRS and they never said that, you know, this won't do either. 
Um, so frankly, they were so yeah. shocked that a musician had his financial maybe act together. Maybe so. So back back to his question real quick. A lot of companies no longer provide actual receipts in the package. It's typically just a right. a, 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 a text or something. It, even. It's yeah. typically just a um, um, what do you call it? Um, a, Invoice? A, a, no, it's a package list. Just what's oh, included a packing in the thing. Oh, a right. packing That's list. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, yeah. so save that original email or confirmation you get from the the party that you purchase it from, and mm -hmm. the IRS should be fine with that. I have a little folder in my mail where basically when I get those kind of things, I just it's called taxes, and I just take that yeah, email I and I just thing. drag it into that folder. I do the same. So thing. at the end of the year, I'll just have all of these things I did. What um, about if I know with my I only use my American Express card unless I'm somewhere mm -hmm. that won't take it, and one of the reasons is they give you the that categorized yep. the monthly Absolutely. and annual yep. statement. Annual state. yeah. yep. uh, is that annual thing good if you're ever audited yes. here? Because it gives hold a lot of detail. It. Yes, hold yeah. on to it. Yeah. Hold on to all of that stuff. The more you can provide the IRS in an audit, the more, I don't say lenient, but it shows that you are making an effort to be honest and forthcoming. I'll, so I'll tell you, you know, the IRS even asked to see my, my calendar, you know, for for my literally your calendar where you right. have things written like, um, you know, had session, you know, did this, went right. there, had meeting, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's, I don't it's have crazy. My, yeah, I have all I of have now. every yeah. one of my daily calendars going uh -huh. back to 1991. Do you really? Wow. Every one of them. Wow. And, and yeah. I was in the middle of a lawsuit one time, yeah. and those things saved my butt. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and yeah. and I, every year I start a spiral-bound notebook. If I have a meeting I'm, and I take notes and that, I save all that stuff. Mm -hmm. You're like Brett Kavanaugh with that calendar all the way back to the... <laughs> I, I, I do it because, frankly, my I don't remember a lot of stuff. Yeah. You know, it's not like I, I, thank God, don't have Alzheimer's or anything, but I, I tend to forget stuff, and I go, I remember <laughs> concepts, not details. So yes. I'll think, oh, I remember talking to an accountant about that like right. four years ago. Right. I can go back and see which accountant and what day I met with that person, call yeah. them up and say, by the way, I'm no longer a client, but. Yeah, that's so great. For those reasons. And yeah, I, I, I tend to be that detailed as well, except the one thing that I need is the one thing that I forget to put on the Of course, <laughs> of course. <laughs> You only have to keep your receipts uh, for the past seven years, yeah. Seven years is cool, but typically the IRS will only go back and audit you after three to four years. So, But it's always good to keep seven years. I've got to tell you guys a great story. Um, I got audited by the IRS one time. Uh, they were trying to determine if the taxi screeners, who are all independent contractors, they have multiple oh, yeah, jobs. I remember this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they have multiple jobs, multiple sources of income. They um, some work remotely. Some used to work in the office. Now everybody's remote. They um, could use our computer, or they could bring their own laptop. So we fit the criteria for an independent contractor. But the state really was suspicious because we had so many screeners and they thought we were trying to skirt paying taxes. We talked to tax attorneys about it, we talked to tax accountants about it, and we claimed them as independent contractors. Well, yeah. I got audited by the EDD, which is the state of California. Yeah. And my accountant uh, cost me about 50 grand to go through that audit Jesus. that year. And the lady was there so much from the EDD that she had a little corner office at my accountant's office. Oh my and he said, under no circumstance should you ever come over here because she will try and entrap you the minute you walk through the front door. One day, I got called and he said, I need this document and I need it in 10 minutes. And whoever I would normally have run it over there wasn't here, maybe lunch, bathroom, whatever. I took it over myself, I walked through the door, and I knew that the lady auditing me was a Russian woman, um, and I knew that she was actually a first chair violinist in a symphony nearby here, a well-known symphony. And I walked through the door, and she goes, Mr. Lesko, with a very thick Russian accent. I'm like, oh my God, I'm trapped. And I said, oh, you're Ludmilla or whatever her name was. And she goes, yes, how do you know? I said, because I looked you up online and congratulations. I understand that you're the first chair um, violinist in XYZ Symphony. And she goes, yes, I am. Right, and I said, I have know. a question for you. Do you sit in a chair that they provide you with? Well, of course. 
Do you go to rehearsals when they tell you the rehearsal is Thursday afternoon at 4 p.m.? Of course I do. And I ask her three or four questions like that. She goes, oh, you're very, very good. Okay, we are done. And I pass the audit. Because she was, if we were guilty, she was guilty. If we weren't guilty, because I'm squeaky clean about that kind of stuff. But they just audit you hoping... I mean, once I got audited, you know, it was like hundreds of thousands of dollars in penalties and back taxes that I would have owed. I came up owing like under thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah. So, well, some employers obviously do want to treat their employees as independent contractors to right. avoid workers' compensation insurance and other taxes and that type of thing. And a lot of times the person working for you is more than happy to do that because their paychecks are bigger. Right. So no one says anything. But you know, uh, at least, you know, no one other than the IRS, right? So Yeah, they yeah. know if they shake enough trees, they will get some money. Mm-hmm. A- and yeah. I understand that's their job. But yeah. anyway, um, guys, th- this was really, really good. Uh, yeah, frankly, good better Thank than I, you. not that I thought it was going to suck. I know yeah. you would never come on the show and bring any topic or a book, which, by the way, I think now you know that there's good stuff in that book. Um I'm quite amazed how much fun we had doing this. Yeah, it was, it good was time. very yeah, lively, absolutely. Brett. Very nice Thank to you meet very you. Much. There was, you know, there's one thing uh, I wanted. One more to question. Comment. No, no, I, I saw it was way back up. You don't need to scroll back through. It was something about um, if you live in your car, it, can you get a tax write-off for that, or something to that effect? Um, I don't know the exact law on that. You certainly want to check with your your accountant. But if if it's not movable, if it's on stands then you have a better chance of being able to use a domicile. Yes. If it's movable and you're, you're, if your wheels were stolen and it's up on blocks, that's that's actually the, the, the law. I mean, but, but if you're constantly moving it from from A to B and C, they might consider it something other than a home. So double check with it. I don't, don't quote me on all that, but I I believe that's kind of the, the, the gray area. So check with your, your CPA. What a unique question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what? A lot of people unfortunately are, living in, I know. Their, in their cars these days yeah. it's, it's sad but um, that actually is a very good question um, for someone who is employed especially maybe an artist who works here and there mm-hmm. and but they're living, living in a van in or yeah, something so yeah. that's actually a very good question to ask your accountant I don't have a solid answer I apologize but that's a I've never great come question that. mentioning yeah. that guy Gooding that I talk about that does the financial literacy tour for like high school kids he has a school bus that they converted to yeah, a, I, a, a residence, yeah. a, a, you know, and the whole thing. Uh-huh. I, yeah, he's on the road like 250 days a year living in that thing. All right. I don't know. Anyway, um, thank you all well, for thanks, joining you us. Yeah, don't miss fun. next week's show. I'm, I haven't exactly nailed down the topic yet, but it's something like myths about taxi. I saw a guy making a comment on YouTube in the comment section today. The guy was completely wrong. There are all these myths that live on about this company. So I want to tell the truth and dispel some of the myths. And I think that many of you who are our regulars will uh, join me in that. Thank you for joining us today. Britt, very, very nice to meet you. Thank you for for, having me. Appreciate it. Yes, for writing what promises to be (laughs) a great book. Bobby, as always, my friend. Um, And we will see you guys next week. Don't forget to give us a like and smash that subscribe button. We will see you next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, nice. No, we're still We're jamming. (laughs) I'm doing a fade. Some but cats, guys,